Uh, welcome everyone to our workshop on building air quality monitoring capacity in uh, Southeast Asia. We are very happy to uh, have all of you as part of this event uh, for the next three days. Uh, so we would like to start with a welcome speech from Mr. Dexter Payne of the Department of State. He is a program manager uh, for for this uh, overseas program. He's a coordinator for air quality and hazardous chemicals in the Office of Environmental Quality, Bureau of Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs, the US Department of State. He oversees the portfolio of assistance projects aimed at building air quality management capacity around the world. He has been a foreign service officer since 2004 and has served in Mexico, Kyrgyzstan, as Azerbaijan, Trinidad, Tobacco, and Washington, DC. Welcome, Mr. Payne. Uh, we welcome you to uh, initiate this conference, this workshop. Thank you very much, Prakash. It is great to be here, and I would like to welcome all the participants. Um, I think what you are doing here is incredibly important, and that's why the Department of State uh, funds projects like this. The name of the project is Building Air Quality Man Monitoring Capacity in Southeast Asia. And so this project is deploying sensors and bringing people together, uh, training them in air quality management techniques. Now, of course, what we really care about in the end is not just monitoring air quality, but actually improving air quality. Um, you all, I'm sure, know better than I do the tremendous costs that air pollution has uh, around the world. Conservatively, about 7 million people die every year from air pollution, and that's more than COVID, that's more than climate change. Um, it's a horrible problem. All of the problems that COVID brought to us were layered on top of the uh, lung problems that people already suffered from existing air pollution and the drains on capacity of the healthcare systems pre-existing from air pollution. Uh, we're not going to solve those problems today, but we believe that by understanding air pollution, by helping build public awareness of the costs of air pollution and how it works, that eventually we can uh, <clears throat> provide cleaner air for everybody. Um, this project is one of about 14 that the US Department of State funds around the world in Southeast Asia, Central Asia, uh, South Asia. Um, they are all basically aimed at increasing air quality management capacity. And that basically means uh, getting people to learn about uh, air quality management and talk to each other. And I think the most important thing that this project will do, that this workshop will do is to start to build bridges among the different countries because you all have a common air shed. You have many of the same problems with uh, emissions and monitoring. And I hope that this will be a step towards improving air quality for everybody in the region. Um, yeah, I'll just uh, stop there and uh, earn the gratitude of everyone. Thank you. And I hope this is a wonderful experience for you. And thank you again for participating. Thank you very much, Mr. Payne. Uh, thanks for the introduction and uh, getting this uh, workshop inaugurated. Next, I would like to welcome Mr. Thomas Schmidt of the US Embassy in Thailand. Mr. Schmidt, Mr. Schmidt is a director of the US Regional Environment Science and Technology and Health Office for East and Southeast Asia, located at the US Embassy in Bangkok. This office helps develop regional policy and programming for the US government and focuses on transboundary water resource management, air quality, food security, clean energy, climate change, among other topics. He has served as a foreign affairs officer, foreign service officer since 2006 and has served in Thailand, Pakistan, Malta, Iraq, Canada, and Washington, DC. Welcome, Mr. Schmidt. 
Thanks, Prakash. And allow me to apologize that I wasn't able to get my background in sync with everyone else. I found one that was as close as can be, but I'm on the browser version of Zoom and it didn't appear to allow me to import uh, pictures, but hopefully this won't be too discombobulating for everyone. But anyway, welcome to everyone participating in this workshop on air quality in Southeast Asia. I want to thank RTI International and all its partners in the region for organizing the event. And I want to thank all of you for participating. As we know, air pollution presents a severe and pervasive threat to millions of people's quality of life and health. And the challenges to addressing these issues are persistent and widespread. Each year, around 7 million premature deaths worldwide are attributable to air pollution, with more than 4 million of those deaths occurring in East and Southeast Asia. And like all forms of environmental pollution, Air pollution is not stopped by political borders. It is transboundary. That makes international cooperation all the more important. Today, RTI International has gathered scientists, technical experts, and policymakers who care about air quality. In the United States, we have made tremendous progress in addressing air pollution over the years. Since passing the Clean Air Act in 1970, we have reduced air pollution by 70%, while growing the economy by 246% over that same period, proving that environmentalism is not counter to economic growth. We have done that partly through cooperation across borders. Our air cooperation, air quality cooperation with Canada is one of the best examples. We have a common interest in sharing scientific know-how on the impact of forest fires and coordinating our policies. So we are achieving the greatest buy-down in air pollution for the least cost. Improvement in air quality is one of the United States' top environmental and public health goals in our engagement in Southeast Asia. We are working closely with countries and stakeholders across the region on air quality programming. Two elements are common to most of our air quality projects. First, having publicly available quality data is crucial to making real progress. When society understands how much pollution is in the air and its effects on health or their loved ones, they tend to push for cleaner air. Many of our programs generate quality data through hybrid air quality monitoring systems. We are supporting this event through the AQSEA project implemented by RTI International. AQSEA is creating a network of low cost sensors in your countries using our US Embassy reference monitors for calibration. Also in the Mekong region, we are supporting through USA's Mekong Air Quality Explorer tool under the Severe Mekong program, a partnership between USAID and NASA in collaboration with the Thai Pollution Control Department and Geoinformatics and Space Technology Development Agency. By using satellites, the Thai government can collect data across a larger area to fill the data gaps and capture a more accurate view of air quality. The second element I'd like to emphasize about our programming is its focus on people. Once you have the data, you need people who can interpret it and institutions that can develop and implement cost-effective pollution management strategies appropriate for local conditions. This event brings those two things together, publicly available quality data and people who are ready to help interpret it to improve the air we all breathe. Again, I would like to thank all the organizers of this event and all of you for dedicating your time and energy to making the world a cleaner and healthier place. I wish you a very successful workshop. Back over to you, Prakash. Thank you very much, Tom. Thanks a lot for the introduction and for giving an overview of the uh, other efforts uh, performed by the Department of State and the Embassy in that region. I will now turn it over to uh, Ms. Natipon to introduce the next two speakers. Okay, uh, the last but not least, we would like to welcome uh, Assistant Professor Dr. Sampan Singharad Varagun, Chiang Mai University Vice President for Research and Innovations to give us some welcome remark, please. Uh, Mr. Dexter Payne. Uh, Department of State Bureau of Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs, Mr. Thomas Schmidt, the United States Embassy in Thailand, Dr. Prakash Dorai Swami, RTI International, distinguished speakers from the United States 
Thailand, Laos, and Vietnam, distinguished guests and participants, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Chiang Mai University, I'd like to welcome you all to the virtual workshop on AQC, Building Air Quality Monitoring Capacity in Southeast Asia today. Um, Chiang Mai University serves an important role on social and research developments with great significance and high impact to all people by applying science and technology to enhance the effectiveness of the research outcomes. Um, identifying a solution of the global uh, or regional issue like uh, quality, especially the haze and its boundary impacts require strong engagement with science and integrated knowledge uh, passing on to the target groups. Uh, likewise, the air quality monitoring network in Southeast Asia would form a strong foundation to help solve the health problems in the region, especially in the upper ASEAN countries, and apply to local requirements that are considered a solid foundation of the countries. Uh, this requires exchange of knowledge, a sharing of experiences, or cooperation and coordination from all upper ASEAN countries. I'm sure that this workshop will provide an opportunity for all of us to learn from the experts in the field and the hope after this workshop, we will better understand why the reliable air quality monitoring network in Southeast Asia is so important to all of us and to what extent we will benefit from. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Department of State Bureau of Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs for financial support that helped make the initial implementation of this project possible and to all of our country members participating in the project. I really hope that today's workshop will be a very beneficial and inspiring one for all of us Thank you very much. So we're gonna start with the AQC project overviews and introductions by uh, Paul Tart, uh, who are the AQC project lead. Okay, is a principal is a principal air quality science at R RTI International USA. So with more than twenty years of experience in the fields of air quality, he is a professional. Uh, professionalist um, interest in the building capacity of stakeholders and has uh, led some si seminar efforts in India. He is the chair of uh, ed editorials reviewer board for the journals of the Air Waste Management Associations and members of the editorial advisory committee for the AVMA, Environmental Management, a uh, Minister of Publications. Welcome, Prakash. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, uh, Dr. Sampan, for the uh, very nice uh, welcome note for all the members. I think you very well said about the regional cooperation that's needed. Uh, and that's the uh, kind of ultimate goal of this uh, project. So what I would like to do is uh, kind of give a quick overview of the project and the workshop. Uh, so this is a project funded by the Department of State and uh, it's in partnership with our wonderful collaborators from uh, Thailand, Laos and uh, Vietnam. So I will give a quick overview of the project and then I will go over the goals of the workshop. What do we really want to get out of this workshop and, and how it is uh, structured. So as uh, the previous speakers mentioned, uh, the air pollution is the fourth largest risk factor for early mortality. In, in order to manage air quality, air quality monitoring is an essential component that is really important. However, there are significant gaps in the availability of reliable air quality monitoring data in the open domain in Southeast Asia. So even if monitors are there, data are not accessible. 
So that is one of the main motivation for this project in order to be able to increase the resolution of the data and help fill those gaps, which will then ultimately help the uh, stakeholders to address and, and mitigate the air pollution challenges. So therefore, the objectives of this project is to engage and train the stakeholders and build their capacity in monitoring air quality in the region. And we start that with, by deploying, uh, with, uh, with their involvement, a low cost sensor network for fine particles. And fine particles are really small particles that are less than 2.5 micrometers in aerodynamic diameter. And those are the particles that have been shown linked to health effects. And so we are deploying a sensor network that will provide data to help support that, to help support air quality actions. And the ultimate goal with this is to be able to expand public awareness and outreach, and then ultimately apply that data from the sensor for model evaluation and for advanced analysis. Like I said, this is a collaborative effort. It's led by RTI International uh, with our wonderful collaborators from uh, Chiang Mai University, National University of Laos, a Research Center for Environmental Monitoring and Modeling from Vietnam, and National Astronomical Research Institute of Thailand. So our leadership is, uh, so I, I'm leading the project out of the US and we have country leads. So we have Dr. Sampon Chantara from Chiang Mai University who's leading the Thailand uh, region efforts. We have Dr. Hung from Center for Environmental Monitoring and Modeling who's leading the efforts for the Vietnam region. We have Dr. Kyo from National University of Laos who's leading the effort for the Laos region. And then we have uh, collaborators, Dr. Vanessa and Dr. Ron from National Astronomical Research Institute of Thailand, who are collaborating with us on this effort to uh, establish a modeling framework that can then ingest this data set uh, and also enable with, uh, with model evaluation. So the data from this project will be helpful for, for their model uh, improvement and development. So on this project, the main activities that we have ongoing uh, right now, like I mentioned, we are deploying the sensor network. Our goal is to have 100 low cost PM2.5 sensors across, uh, in total across Thailand, Laos and Vietnam. And we are using the Purple Air Sensor, that's the name of the company from the US. So we're using uh, Purple Air Sensors uh, for deployment. In addition to that, we are leveraging 300 sensors, uh, the Dust Boy sensors that are already deployed in Thailand by Chiang Mai University, by Dr. Seth and his team uh, from Chiang Mai University. So you can see uh, the current status is that so far we have deployed a total of 42 purple air sensors, 18 in Thailand, five in Laos, 19 in Vietnam. And the map below on the bottom left shows the distribution of those sensors. And on the right is the map of the dust boy sensors in Thailand. You can clearly see the spatial resolution that you can gain in these measurements by using these sensors. And so the idea here is we do not want to repeat what's already been done. So we are deploying few sensors in Thailand uh, for the purple air sensors so that we can generate relationship between the purple air sensor and the dust boy sensor. So that way we can make use of the data that's already available from the dust boy sensors along with the purple air sensors. And then much of the deployment we are planning for Laos and Vietnam to help fill these gaps in, in the monitoring data. And so as part of these other activities include training the stakeholders and engaging them in expanding sensor networks. So like I said, we so far installed 42 sensors and for the remaining 58 sensors, we are looking to engage stakeholders and get feedback from them 
or in expanding the sensor network, where do you think the sensors are needed? Where do you think additional data would be needed? That is part of the discussion on day three. And then also helping, you know, applying the sensor data to potentially support activities uh, that will help uh, understand the air quality. Uh, we are going to be performing outreach activities such as this. This is the first workshop. We were supposed to be performing this in person last year. Uh, of course, due to the pandemic, uh, this was on hold. Uh, and then we, again, due to the uncertainty, we decided to move forward with a virtual option. Uh, we hope to meet in person with all of you uh, at some point as part of the next workshop. We also plan to hold a webinars between now and the end of next year uh, to continue this discussion. And we will be developing uh, educational materials and videos and we'll be using data from these sensors to help raise public awareness as part of this uh, network. And ultimately, what we hope to gain out of this uh, project is that the sensor network would fill gap in the reference monitor and perform as a hybrid network along with any existing regulatory monitoring network that's there. Uh, so it's not a replacement, but we wanted to complement uh, fill in the gaps where that is not affordable to be done with the regulatory monitor. So ultimately then we would get an improved understanding of the spatial distribution, the temporal variation of PM 2.5. Uh, we will have high temporal data for the model evaluation, uh, which will then help us understand any potential gaps in emission inventories and ultimately lead to regional awareness and potential regional efforts to tackle air pollution. One of the reasons we chose these three countries, Thailand, Laos, and Vietnam, is to look at that regional aspect. So you, all three countries are adjacent to each other, and, to, and the data from this network, we, we hope, will provide insights into the, the impact on, on how, it, how the regional background across these three regions. Now, what do we want to gain out of this specific workshop? Uh, so the goal of this workshop is to bring together the stakeholders, such as yourself, to discuss the current challenges, current issues, and then how do we use this sensor network to uh, engage and to uh, work towards a common goal of expanding the monitoring. Like uh, Ms. Natipon mentioned, we have this workshop organized to three days. The focus is as follows. First day is going to, is, it's an introduction. So it's going to be looking, we're going to be talking about the air quality in Southeast Asia and understand the current regulatory framework. What is there there currently? What are the standards currently available? And what are the plans? And so once you understand that regulatory framework and the current status, day two, that's tomorrow, we will talk about the, specifically about the air quality monitoring network. Again, looking at what's the current status and then we will share on what's been done so far on this, on the AQC network. And on the last day, we will talk specifically about what do we see in the data so far based on the sensors deployed for the past uh, eight to 12 months. And, and then have a brainstorming discussion on how that data can be applied to solve the air pollution challenges that each of you may be seeing. My slides are stuck, there you go. So ultimately what we want to uh, accomplish from this workshop is we hope once at the end of this workshop, each of you will have an improved understanding of the challenges in this region, uh, the, how, to, how to monitor air quality, the pros and cons of a low cost sensor and how do we use the data. And ultimately, we, what I would really like to get out of this workshop is inputs from each of you as part of the brainstorming session on day three. So we really need your inputs. We're really, uh, requesting your participation in this workshop and specifically on day three when we have the brainstorming discussion. We read inputs on additional locations where sensors are needed. How can you apply this data in the short and long term? And perhaps together, maybe we help a uh, plan, come up with a pathway on how you might use this data and perhaps, uh, you know, achieve or towards the goal of uh, improvement in, in air quality. And I think we've gone over this already. So if you have any questions, use the chat. Uh, 
The brainstorming discussion is on day three, and like Natapan already mentioned, we'll have breakout rooms on that day. So the discussion will be in the regional language. And then once that's there done, then we will have regrouping uh, where each country's summary will be presented. And then we'll have a discussion uh, uh, across the three countries to basically understand the regional perspective. I think I'll stop there. So we, I think the last point has already been covered. So basically I would ask that uh, use this opportunity, participate in discussions, provide constructive inputs, and brainstorm ways on how to use this data. We really want this workshop to be useful to you, and we want this data to be useful to all of you. So thank you again, and uh, welcome to uh, for to this work. We can move to another section. We talk about the air uh, pollution and impacts. So let's start with the globals of the Southeast Asia perspective of air quality. Please welcome Dr. Vanessa from Nality, the researcher in the atmospheric research, and also uh, AQC collaborators and Prakash again. Welcome, please. Okay, thank you very much uh, for uh, welcoming me, and also I'm very pleased to uh, have the opportunity to join today. Uh -huh. uh, uh, we would like to actually uh, starting our. Um, uh, discussion, I think, uh, and uh, uh, and thanks for the opportunity for me to share all together on this uh, the global uh, to Southeast Asia perspective on the air quality. Uh, actually, uh, a part of the presentation uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Prakash as well. Uh, so uh, just to emphasize on what we have already actually uh, a number of uh, people are already mentioned about that, how important, uh, why we need to uh, study or this uh, care actually, you know, like in the perspective of us in uh, the academy, of course, we want to study, but of course the most important thing is that we should be able to take care of the air pollution. Uh -huh. So in this, uh, we already learned that the air pollution uh -huh, is the, uh, fourth largest risk of early mortality that has been um, studied uh, by uh, the group of researchers uh, and published uh, in 2019 uh, for this fact that is the fourth largest risk uh, following uh, some other uh, uh, dates. Uh, uh, this is a global attributable date from um, the risk factor. Uh, between male and female, you can see that it's slightly not much different. Uh -huh. So uh, it's the same trend is that the air pollution uh, affecting a lot on, on uh, the, the what we call the global burden of uh, the diseases and risk factors for across the world. So from this, um, we know that uh, the air pollution is also uh, contribute to about uh, 6.6 uh, 6, 6 million, 6.67 million deaths globally, uh, and this is uh, about 70% uh, in Southeast Asian country. So you might see that um, the color is not as, you know, um, uh, as high, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the number of date uh, as shown in this color scheme is not as high as in China or India, uh, but still, of course, uh, the depends on uh, the, the data. I think that is the big issue that we have got in uh, Southeast Asia, and that is uh, coming to why we need this uh, project and also this uh, workshop that we are going to discuss about. So as you can see that the eight um, standardized dates, uh -huh, you see, uh, and even in Myanmar, Laos, uh, and uh, Cambodia, our neighboring countries to Thailand, um, also um, pretty high. Mm -hmm up to um, yeah, 100, uh, 120, 170 deaths uh, per 100,000 people. So this is affecting a lot in the low and the middle income countries, um, and uh, particularly in Southeast Asia, uh, our countries are. So as we already know that the diseases, uh, I got this picture from uh, my colleague in the uh, Clean Air Asia and the Clean Air, um, 
uh, coalition climate and clean air actually so we started to focus on what are the causes of the air pollution and we see that the ozone and pm 2.5 is uh, among the uh, first priority and as you can see that if we look closer to southeast asia of course, PM2.5 is a very high. Uh, we monitor and not enough um, monitoring, of course. And we know that uh, the PM2.5 affecting a chronic obstructing pulmonary disease, huh? COPD and childhood uh, pneumonia, this um, heart disease and stroke. Huh? Uh, we see uh, also even for the uh, women, huh? Um, the babies, we have a low birth weight. I think this uh, will be uh, touched upon with uh, more detail in the next speaker as well. So very important. So, but in Southeast Asia, uh -huh, if we look back into where I am here and where um, many of us here, uh, Thailand, Laos and Vietnam, we're looking into air pollution crisis as a crisis and it's in combination uh, with a climate change issue. Mm -hmm. Why are we looking at that? Uh -huh. We know that um, actually air pollutants are also short-lived and climate pollutants. You can consider that these short-lived climate pollutants, and this is a slide from the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. Um, a number of our colleagues in Southeast Asia are uh, involved in this uh, study so that we want to communicate to the policymakers as well that when we want to tackle PM2.5, we also at the same time uh -huh, uh, reducing uh, the earth temperature, uh, so to speak, which means that uh, PM2.5 uh, compose of the black carbon, and therefore we need to uh, reduce um, uh, that. So it has the about the die hundred, um, you know, like um, almost uh, more than half of uh, the climate impacts uh, of uh, HFC, for example. And therefore, uh, the climate mitigation uh, pathway can be quick, uh, as has been illustrated on this um, um, diagram that the black carbon. Um, and methane can re be reduced up to 0.5 degrees C and uh, or shortly will be uh, also that much as uh, 0.6. Uh, so, so there is this latest study uh -huh, coming from, uh, it's, it's published in Lancet Planet Health that indicate that if we combined uh, the study, uh, the, the climate uh, scenario with uh, the PM2.5, uh, so we can reduce at the same time the premature mortality. As you can see that if we start now, so from 2020 up to 2050, we can achieve the lower um, uh, temperature uh -huh. and also at the same time premature date will be reduced as well. Uh, this uh, is very highlighted in China, but of course in Southeast Asia we have less data. Uh, of course, this study in AXI will uh, complement more of the data for such a similar study. So we know that the climate impact have uh, on both drought and flooding, but certainly forest fire is so important. For it's why so important in Southeast Asia, and this resulting in PM2.5 uh, um, unavoidably. Uh, so, and also the surface ozone and nitrogen dioxide and nitrogen oxides. This uh, or the like a suite of air pollution. And the source of these are transportation industries as well as uh, the forest fires that I mentioned earlier. So, uh, this is the latest study uh, from. Um, the publication uh, from actually this is from southern Vietnam, uh, a very interesting that uh, they have indicated a meteorological factor that affecting our Southeast Asia, uh, the mega cities, uh, uh, particularly this is Ho Chi Minh City. Um, they uh, there was the event that the forest fire uh, 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 when the winds coming from the north uh, also affecting uh, the city mega city like Ho Chi Minh City, and also uh, when the wind coming from the south. That is the event. Um, the top one is in 2013, and the bottom one is from the 2015 uh, biomass burning uh, event, uh, actually from Indonesia. It could come as far as Ho Chi Minh City. So as you can see that the meteorological uh, situation uh, is so significant. So the city, in particularly in our Mekong region, uh -huh, mainland uh, Southeast Asia, can be affected a lot. Uh -huh. Uh, at times of the year, uh -huh. 
uh, from um, in both wind, winds direction. This also uh, affecting in Bangkok. Mm -hmm. This is uh, my capital city uh, in Thailand. Uh, there is a heat space situation uh, in these um, last few months uh, in February. And also, uh, as you can see, the visibility can be so poor. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so to speak that in Northern Thailand, where I am, uh, when I read our headquarters is uh, also have a, we have observation uh, of the air quality and we are have the picture of uh, how uh, the visibility can be reduced uh, day by day uh, and we also have the lidar um, to observe uh, the uh, level of air pollution uh, in the Bari layer of the city of Chiang Mai where we are and also in the southern Thailand in Hat Yai Songkla uh, as you can see these are uh, the picture from our um, research um, team uh, in, in the RIT as well. So, uh, so certainly just to um, make it short uh, so that we can study more that uh, certainly the global uh, air pollution uh, as we aware of in the past few years, COVID-19, mm -hmm, there has been publication also indicating that uh, it has very much related. Uh, the link between COVID-19 and the air pollution is also unavoidable. In the beginning, we think that the air pollution could be reduced during the lockdown, but then now, uh, as we see that there is increasing risk of the people of the country, and in particular with the weather and uh, this um, that affecting the air pollution, that the country uh, that are prone to uh, more of uh, uh, air pollution will be affected. Uh, that people can uh, get more of the COVID nineteen as well, uh -huh. and with the health of people that deteriorate. So just to say that we need a collaboration. Uh -huh. This is an example from Thailand. We have started with the Atmospheric Science Consortium. We had the workshop since 2019, and we have uh, trying to draw together the researchers uh, internationally. And also we uh, would like to uh, expand this more. Uh -huh. We have, um, you know, like a number of countries of our uh, friends uh, from universities and the government organizations. So we have started off with the Thailand Consortium for Atmospheric Research. Then just to, uh, conclude my talk is that we need the understanding, uh, the air that we breathe uh, in order to improve our quality of life and this project will be a good start. So thank you so much uh, for your attention and uh, I would like to pass this on to the next uh, speaker. Thank you very much Dr. Vernisai who gave us the uh, pollution situations in global aspect and also give us uh, the relationships of air pollution with the other issues, for example, COVID-19 and also uh, climate change. So, uh, Prakash, do you have something to say or we can move to another section? Uh, I don't know if anyone has any questions. Maybe they can uh, ask in the chat if, uh, if there, maybe we can entertain one question and if not, maybe we can have them in the chat and then Dr. Vanessa can uh, respond in the chat. Does anyone have any question? So maybe raise your hand using the hand feature. Yeah, I think maybe we can move on, but if you have questions, please do uh, put it in the chat and then uh, Dr. Vanessa will respond. And likewise, the other speakers also will, will respond uh, as, we, as we go. Okay. For the next topic, we're going to talk about the health impact of air pollution and uh, we specific focus on Southeast Asian countries. So we have uh, invited the guest speaker from the um, Faculty of Medicine Chiang Mai University, Professor Chai Chan Potirak, who is professor in the medicine. So he has been studied about the impacts of air pollution on health for a long, long time. And uh, he has several publications on that point. So please welcome Dr. Uh, Professor Chai Chan. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Co-Chairman, lady and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to chair uh, the topic on of air pollution's impact on health with specific focus on Southeast Asian country. The air is the most important food for life. It affects our human health since prenatal period, newborn, infant, child, adult, and elders, from the first bed to the last bed. 
the air contains uh, air pathogens, contains uh, physical air condition like humidity, temperature, and barometric pressure. But today we not focus on these two items. We focus on air pollution, air pollutants. The air pollutants have classified by the source as ambient air pollutions and household air pollutants. Both kind have particulate matter and gaseous air pollutants. The most common and persistent long term is a PM 2.5 that have great impact on our health. This is the picture from the HEPA filter fiber. You can see the PM 2.5 uh, attached to the filter fiber. And this is a electron microscopic view of the PM 2.5. When we inhale the PM 2.5 through our nose, pass to our nasal cavity, down to the larynx, gone to the lower airway, and then absorbed by alveoli capillary membrane to diffuse to the circulations of our body. So the PM2.5 can affect all our body organ system, especially the body organ that vital organ have high uh, blood supply. This is the example from one of my patients. Yes, uh, he inhaled the, the air pollutants, the smoke, and the smoke come down to the lower airway have inflammation in the bronchial tree. The, the nature of uh, PM2.5 down like this by uh, force of inhalation and the low molecular weight is deposited on the top of the uh, upper part of the lower, lower lung. And when they did a CT scan, you can see inflammation in the alveoli. And when I do bronchorea lavas, the return fluid is, uh, is a bloody fluid. It means that it affects a lot of inflammation in our alveoli. And after that, it's diffused to the blood circulation, to the blood vessel of our organ system, to the tissue, to the lung, especially the respiratory system, heart, nervous system, kidney and immune system. By experimentals and epidemiological study, it's confirmed that PM2.5 impact on human health not, is not just a myth. The experimental study mostly done in animal model and some study done in human being. And then repeated study with improved methodology and technology do confirm study in various group of populations do confirm the impact of PM2.5 on human health. Also by heterogeneous investigator group by meta-analysis international to global study, all of this study confirm PM2.5 have great impact on human health. The most serious impact on human health is premature death or serious illness, like hospitalizations, emergency visits by group of respiratory disease, such pneumonia, asthma exacerbations, uh, exacerbation of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, cardiovascular disease like acute coronary syndrome, myocardial infarction, sudden death syndrome, and nervous system disease, especially stroke, both ischemic and hemolytic stroke and lung cancer, et cetera. The moderate degree to affect our body health is people have symptoms, and then people have disease, and people need medications, and people have impaired quality of life and impair of work productivity. But the subclinical effect by physiological or biological derangement cause inflammations repairing, remodeling, regenerations, and mutation of gene. But people unrecognize this uh, subclinical effect. By of this subclinical effect, 
when time pass by or export to high concentrations of PM 2.5, people have symptoms, have disease, have impaired quality of life, have impaired work productivity, and then people when have serious premature death or serious illness. This is the pyramid of health. The effect of PM 2.5 can affect uh, various degree. This is the subclinical, as I uh, told you already. This is the moderate by the disease, by the symptom, the disease, medication use, impair quality of life, work productivity. And this is the serious condition or disease like emergency visit, admitted or dead. It depends on degree of exposure, both concentrations and duration of exposure with pre genetic predisposition also. Some people have no effect throughout their life. Some people have uh, early effect of PM2.5. It depends on genetic predispositions also. When we do PM2.5 related disease focus monitoring, most of the researchers, the WHO, United Nations, or global burden disease usually monitor some of this because there are many diseases that are PM2.5 related. But the important disease that usually we do research and disease monitoring is daily mortality, emergency visits, hospitalization, and annual death. For the infectious disease, we do usually we do monitor pneumonia. For the NCD, non-communicable disease, is a top hit disease in the uh, aging era, like ischemic heart disease, COPD, stroke, and lung cancer. This is a common uh, disease for monitoring the effect of PM2.5 on health. The air pollution affect the disease like NCD, infections, and allergy, and then have adverse effects. So it's increased mortality, morbidity, and healthcare costs. So it's impede our economy of the society, of the country, of the regions, and globally. And then when uh, the region, the society, the countries uh, drop down the economics, they have increased air pollution again. This is the vicious cycle. So not only health, but also economy. I would like to focus with us on Southeast Asian regions. The data mostly from global burden disease. This is the GBD 2017. You can see in the Southeast Asia, the global death, annual global death that attributable to PM2.5 is between six to more than 10% of total death. Let's say in Thailand, about six to 8% in Laos, in Cambodia, more than 10%. In Philippines, allow eight to ten percent like this. Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Brunei, also six to eight percent of total deaths annual death. And when we classify the the death rate per one hundred thousands, uh, attributable to PM two point five by social social demographic index, like. High, high income country, and this is the low income country. The difference in death rate is approximately 10 times. Country with low income country have a high impact of death rate, 200 per 100,000, but people with, living in the high SDI country, only 20 per 100,000 deaths. In our country in Southeast Asian region, usually with a low-middle SDI country, mostly classified as low-middle 
SDI country and Thailand be classified as middle SDI country by uh, World Bank record. So in Thailand, for example, is affect that about 110 per 100,000 population. And Thailand have 70 million people. So in the year 2019, uh, estimate this in Thailand is nearly uh, 80,000 80, people or equal to 14% of total annual death. As I told you in the year 2017, in Thailand estimate to be six to 8%, but now it's rapidly increased to 14% of the total death. And the country in Southeast Asia, mostly low SDI and low middle income country have increased ambient PM air pollution, PM2.5, about 4% annually, 4% annually. And the middle income countries uh, increase about only 1%. For by age group, uh, the, the orange earlier is the young age group. The, this is the middle, and this is the elderly, more than 70 years old. You can see in Southeast Asian country, low middle SDI have increasing death our age group. And the middle SDI country increasing they're mostly in a, uh, between 50 to 70, mostly increased death. The disease that caused increased death is pneumonia, lung cancer, COPD, stroke, and heart disease. You can see especially heart disease and stroke and COPD uh, uh, increased Death in all in people with more than fifty years old. If we can reduce PM two point five, we can reduce premature death by the model of four scenario. Annual PM two point five thirty five is scenario four. Scenario three, 25, 20, uh, scenario two, 15, and scenario one, uh, 10, annual PM 2.5. In Southeast Asia, usually annual PM 2.5 below 35. So if we do set our air quality 35, we do nothing to decrease the death in the future. If we set the scenario as 25, we decrease the death. At 15, we also much more decrease the death. And if we set to 10, we can decrease the death by uh, 4% annually. And this is the disease that affect by PM2.5 caused premature death from 1999 to 2014, this is the total. For example, the stroke is increasing in the recent past five years. And if we can reduce PM2.5 from scenario four to scenario one, we can decrease safe life of the people 20, 20 times. Now, uh, 400,000, and if we can decrease to 10, it's only 20,000 life premature death loss. And if we decrease also the ischemic heart disease, COPD, lung cancer, pneumonia, and total death, we can save life 600,000 if we can do that.
this is all I would like to say in 15 minutes. Thank you for your attention. Yes, again, thank you very much, uh, Professor Shai Chan Portilak, who gave us such um, important awareness information about the effect of air pollution on health, human health. So before we go to uh, the next speaker, any questions from the audience? So if you have any questions, you can uh, leave your questions in the chat box and we will ask, uh, we will answer later. Uh, let's move to uh, another topic. So the next speaker, welcome Exocite, Professor Dr. Sopon Chantara, who is the head of uh, Environmental Science Research Center, Faculty of Science, Chiang Mai University, and also AQC leader for uh, Thailand. Uh, she will talk about the sorts of air pollution in Thailand. So please welcome uh, Dr. Sopon, please. Thank you very much, Matipon, for introduction. Let me share my slide. All right. Um, actually, I was assigned to talk about the source of air pollution in Thailand. However, I'm go going to focus more on Northern Thailand because I have research results uh, mostly from Northern Thailand. However, I think uh, it, it is comparable to our Southeast Asian countries, particularly in the upper part of Southeast Asia. Uh, as Dr. Vanessa already mentioned about the source of air pollution, normally we can have various kinds of source, for example, road traffic emission industries. But most importantly, in our region, open burning is very important. When they talk about open burning, it's uh, include forest fires, agricultural waste burning, and burning of domestic waste. This is the map showing the active fire hotspots in Southeast Asia. So this data was gathered during January to April in the year 2019. Uh, the different colors you see in this map represent uh, monthly accumulation. So the yellow uh, color is January, and the uh, next one here is the February, the red is March, and the last one is April. So we can see that the pattern of open burning is changing from the beginning of the year. More burning is found in the South or in Cambodia, in some parts of Laos. But lately in March and April, more open burning are found in Northern Thailand, Myanmar, and Laos. And if we plot a graph to see the pattern of uh, open burning. This is start in January until April. At the beginning of the year, as I already mentioned, more open burning was found in Cambodia. But in March and April, more are found in Laos, Thailand, and Myanmar. And if we accounted in percentage, Myanmar has the open burning uh, almost 40% followed by Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia, while in Vietnam, it's less than 10%, okay? This is the data from the dry season in the year 2019. However, the number or the counts of the active fire hotspots might be changed years by years, but the patterns are almost the same. The factors that affecting air pollution in Northern Thailand can be divided into three factors. The first one is the geography. Because most of the cities in Northern Thailand are located in the basin surrounded by mountains. The second factor is the meteorological factors. For example, calm wind, less rain, or temperature inversion. These factors can also uh, affecting the amount of air pollutants in the basin. And the last one is the very important factors because this one is the human activities. The source of air pollution, it can be traffic emission or open burning. However, open burning seems to be the major source in this region. As I mentioned about the geography of the Northern Thailand, here is the map showing to you again the cross section from the west direction to the east direction. So we have like uh, Mehosong Basin followed by Chiang Mai Lampun Basin, which is the biggest 
uh, based in, in northern Thailand. So each uh, city seems to have their own environment, stay in a basin surrounded by the high mountains. If we talk about air pollution, particulate matters are very important pollutants. PM10, PM2.5, or PM0.1. The coarse particles of PM10, when we comparing the size of the PM with the human hair, so normally human hair has a diameter around 70 micron. The PM10 is smaller than a human hair around seven times, while the PM2.5 or the particulate matters with the diameter less than 2.5 micron uh, is smaller than PM10 about four times. The ultrafine particles are very small. They have a size equal to virus. So all of them, we cannot see them by our naked eyes. Let's take a look at the daily PM2.5 concentrations in Chiang Mai city. So we got this data from pollution control department at Chiang Mai station. So the data went back to the year 2011 up to now. So the red line you see here is the Thailand national air quality standard for 24 hours. So it should not exceed 50 microgram per cubic meter. However, in the dry season, let's say during February until April, the PM2.5 concentration, daily concentration, uh, always higher than the standard. In some day, we got a very high concentration over 200 microgram per cubic meter. For instance, in the year 2015 or 2019, luckily this year, the air pollution is not so serious because we have more rain in the dry season from times to times. Before we do the source analysis of the uh, air pollution, we have to collect the air pollutants. In this study uh, funded by the National Thailand Research Fund, we collect the PM2.5 samples. The way to collect the samples, we can use various types of air samplers. This one is the high volume air sampler, low volume and mini volume air sampler. This is the filter paper we use to collect the PM2.5 sample. It is the quartz fiber filters. After the 24 hour sampling, we've got this kind of uh, filter. Very, you can see the black or gray color over the white filter paper. And these also the two PM2.5 samples collected by the low volume and mini volume air samplers. After we got the samples, we will analyze the chemical composition to find out the major chemical composition that can be representative of the source. In our lab, we analyze the organic compounds, for example, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons using GCMS. We analyze water soluble ions using ion chromatograph analyze uh, metals using ICP. And uh, the last one is carbon analyzer for carbon analysis. If we talk about the pollutants, the air pollutants, the primary pollutant source can be emitted from biomass burning, traffic emission, road dust, soil suspension, and so on. But if we talk about the secondary pollutants, it means chemical reactions in the atmosphere. It can be organic aerosol or inorganic aerosols. In, in this research, uh, the thing that I'm going to explain to you, uh, we will compare the source between two areas. Uh, spatial variation is the comparison between two areas. We select Chiang Mai city and Nan province for comparison. And the next one is the temporal variation. Uh, we will compare between smoke haze period and non-smoke haze period. 
Before we can do that, we have to identify the source traces. For example, for biomass burning, we have to select significant source traces. For example, levoglucosan, potassium ion, or organic carbons. For the traffic source, we use elemental carbons. For the road dust, we use the metals, such as calcium, copper, and zinc. For the secondary aerosols, we might use nitrate, sulfate, and ammonium. So this is the uh, spatial variation. We compare between two areas. The first one is Chiang Mai city. This, the location is in this map. Chiang Mai city was uh, identified as the receptor site and Nanoi district in Nan province was selected and identified as near agricultural burning source. Uh, in the year 2017, when we collect the samples during the dry season in March and April, the concentration of PM 2.5 were not so high. The Chiang Mai and Nan has a very similar concentration, only about 40 microgram per cubic meter in average. Uh, for Chiang Mai city, we can identify the source in 2% like that. Uh, traffic emission is about 20%, biomass burning is around 40%, and the rest is the secondary aerosols. For Nan province, the traffic uh, contribution is less, it's about 15%, while uh, biomass burning is higher, it's about 50%, as you also can see in this table. So in conclusion, Chiang Mai city has more contribution from traffic emission, while in Nan province has more uh, contribution from biomass burning. And when we compare the temporal variation, we select Chiang Mai city as the, uh, our study site. We select Rincam intersection, which is the road site and has a high volume of traffic in this area. So this is our sampling site. So we compare between smoke haze period and non-smoke haze period in the year 2021. This is the result. So when we compare smoke haze period and non-smoke haze period, we got the PM2.5 average concentration. During the smoke haze period, the concentration of PM2.5 is quite high. It's about 120 microgram per cubic meter. While during non-smoke haze period or in July, the concentration is dropped to about 40 microgram per cubic meter. When we adjust the concentration into 100%, so then we can compare the contribution of source like in this graph. Um, in average, so when, when we average both smoke haze period and non-smoke haze period together, this is the source ratios. The traffic emission is around 20%, biomass burning is around 35%. The road dust is 15% and the secondary aerosol is around 30%. How about if we compare between smoke haze period and non-smoke haze period? What we see here, so during smoke haze period, the green color here is biomass burning is very high. While in non-smoke haze period, the traffic emission is very high, almost 70%. And in the table here, we compare source by source. During the smoke haze period, the traffic emission is less than 10%, while during non-smoke haze period, traffic is up to 70%. Biomass burning during the smoke haze period is almost 50%, and non-smoke haze period, only 6%. Interestingly, the secondary aerosols during the smoke haze period is also high, so it's almost 30%, while during non-smoke haze period, it's only 1%, or almost none. 
What does it mean? It means if we have long-term air pollution in the area, the accumulation of air pollutants in uh, the, the region can be changed to secondary aerosol. And it can also have different types of health impacts later. I will come to the conclusions. The air pollutants in Northern Thailand are emitted mainly from biomass burning, traffic, roast dust or soil, and maybe some minor uh, contribution from other source. The secondary pollutants were found after long term of accumulation. The contribution ratio of source depend on areas and times. To reduce air pollution, we have to reduce the primary source of air pollution. So this is very important. Thank you very much for your kind attention. If you have any question, you are welcome. Thank you very much, um, Professor Somporn. In the chat, uh, Professor Somporn, thank you very much. Please share the paper about source apportionment for HITS and non hits period in 2000, 2031. Uh, 21 in the chat. Yes, I'm uh, sure we can do that. We did not publish this paper yet, but we have some short report that can share with you. Okay, the, and have some questions from Lon. Can the secondary errors or data be broken down further, such as uh, phosphate, nitrate? Sure, it can be react further in the atmosphere and change to different kind of chemicals. So I, I had one question. Um, thank you very much. That's a very nice presentation. So uh, you know, in terms of percentage, you mentioned that the, the traffic contribution is about 10% during the smoke period and 70% during the non-smoke period. On an absolute concentration basis, uh, does it translate to being somewhat similar throughout the year? In other words, is the traffic contribution, uh, I guess, somewhat steady throughout the year? Yes, uh, maybe the percentage cannot be compared only that, but we might have to see the concentration as well. Uh, for example, oh, sorry, can you see my slide? Yes. Mm -hmm. The one with the concentration here. Yeah. Okay. Um, you see that the concentration is very high during the smoke haze period, but it's low in, in non smoke haze period. When we calculate into percentage, so we will see different contribution of source. However, even we see very high contribution of traffic in the non smoke haze period, but the concentration of PM2.5 is quite low. So, okay, so, so even in terms of concentration basis, I think it increases slightly during the non haze period. Is that due to uh, more, more driving or is it just the meteorology that, that causes it? Do we know the, the reason for the traffic, uh, the slight increase in the traffic during the non haze period? Yeah, there, there should be many factors that can affect this uh, increasing contribution of the, the traffic. I don't know yet exactly because we did not analyze in depth yet, but that, that's correct. It might be the number of vehicles increasing or also the meteorological factors that can affect you to that concentration. Thank you very much. I think this is very interesting. So basically, if we were to you know, summarize it. So during the non-smoke haze period, it's primarily traffic related, right? It's road dust and vehicular emissions. So that both related to vehicles. And during the smoke haze period, it's primarily biomass from like the burning. So it's, it's uh, for Chiang Mai city, at least, it seems like you have two primary sources that, that if, if we can address those challenges, it might help improve the air quality. Thank you. Okay, uh, Professor Somhon, they have a distant question according to Ron questions. So Ron said, can we measure further the types of secondary aerosol? For example, how many percent sulfate, how many so percent nitrate? Yes, normally we also monitor the sulfate and nitrate in our research. We, we can, can uh, 
calculate that as well. Yeah. Ron, you can do the research with us. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Professor Somhon. And right now we're gonna move to another country. Uh, this is our neighbor as well. This, uh, for the next section, uh, we're gonna talk about the source, sources of air pollution in Laos. So please welcome Mr. Tilakon. So he is a technical researcher at National Research and Environmental Research Institute, Ministry of Natural Research, Resource and Environment at Laos. Please welcome. And once again, my name is Tilakon from uh, Monday for today, we are present uh, for the source of the air pollution in Laos. So uh, this, this is the contents for my presentation today. Uh, for the first one is the impl uh, implementation of the air quality monitoring. The second one is the air quality monitoring baseline that I will buy. And for the, uh, the third one is the air quality uh, source classification. And for the first one is the implementation of the air quality monitoring. I present of the Mary, 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 just name the name of my organization. But uh, monitoring and analyze the air quality by using equipment. Uh, for this equipment, we analyze for air quality. We have air quality monitoring stations, uh, mobile air quality monitoring, air quality monitoring and analyze equipment, and EM255 station, and the complete uh, we just complete of a part and measuring air quality uh, outside. <laughs> And the second one, the air quality monitoring baseline data. Uh, I would like to inform that we can't complete the story of the air quality monitoring part of the uh, 18th program measurement in the country. And we identified uh, 41 experimental part complete uh, monitoring and air quality in the uh, 15th program. Uh, for this, the figure is to show uh, the data, the deadline. Baseline data that we got from. And I want to inform that before we will classify the source of the air, uh, air pollution source. So we, uh, we collect the uh, information uh, in every every province. And uh, this, is, this figure will show the equipment that we use to collect the baseline data in every province that we got. We have a uh, this equipment we uh, have a parameter for PM10, PM2.5 in every province. And in every province, we are uh, classified for uh, two sites for urban sites and urban center. And this, uh, this picture will show the equipment what we have for monitoring for collecting the baseline data. And this is the data that we got. For this one, uh, this will show the and this is the will show the where we are collecting the baseline data. And this is a parameter that we got from the baseline data. There are all ozone, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, NOx, and the PM10, TSP, PM2.5. So that's we got a environmental also. And this is all water, uh, the data we have. From the deadline data collection. And then uh, after we got the deadline data collection, so we can classify that <clears throat> the rational from using representative or bottom up sort and information and pollution loads and estimation. And we now, after we uh, classify that, we can get information that uh, the main source of the air pollution, we can classify that there are two main sources. The first one is the non sport source uh, pollution. For the non sport source pollution, it is from agriculture and land use chain, sheep agriculture for deforestation. And the second one is the oil source pollution. The oil source pollution is from Battery and that's the soil and some of that is from the power plant. <clears throat> and this figure will show this information from the two thousand and forties that show the emission estimation. From this figure, you will uh, see the amount of the agriculture forestry lands you just show. Yeah. And this uh, 
uh, presentation to show the average uh, the emission from the faster core physics environment. This emission factor is the, from uh, progress to burn. So this is the US, the US is the, uh, the, uh, the parameter that's a concern to the concentration of the pollution. Uh, this is from branch mass, CPAN, and the Tesla. But this slide is to show the emissions from the common students from the burning from agriculture rest in Latvia from uh, 1999 to 1990, the total 2019. The pollution directly uh, proportional to the amount of agricultural production increased significantly over the last of 20 years. And the importance of the open burning of the Rice residue is also friends, dominated by the particle PM10 and PM2.5, also methane and non methane volatile organic compound, also important and increasing the importance of the sulfur dioxide and NOx pollution is from mass and sugar cane residue in the recent year. And for this slide, it showed uh, the concentrations on the agriculture production and the associated evolution from rest to burn, especially in the savanna pit, some stock and the province around the region. Um, this is showing the importance of a sulfur side not from uh, sugar cans and cassava pollution in the province, such as Konsali, Sayambuli, and Slovan. Um, I'm not sure that the, the picture you can see on the class is too small. Okay, for continuous. Uh, uh, this will show the area of the kilns by burning, burning estimates from uh, satellite data from uh, 2018 and 2019 and 2020. Uh, this picture will show the, for the biomedicity and the burn fresh. A fraction the reverse from a typical volume from the different lens cover ties. Eric Green bought least uh, uh, forest clearly accountants for uh, most biomass burn. Okay, this is uh, the the video and this video uh, I collect it but when when I are collecting the baseline data in the field, this is the real situations of the uh, the activity of the people. In the local area of that activity, this activity is the local uh, local dead clearance for the uh, uh, for the for the agricultural purpose. So sorry for the problem. Uh, my video is can is doesn't work. And this uh, be, be behind me right now is the show that are burning. And this is the, the the main source of the pollution in the uh, the in the northern part of the. Uh, of my country, um, <clears throat> when when they burn, uh, because the the people in the local area when they burn they cannot control. But when they burn, the they when they cannot control the burning is the uh, is a large area. When it's, it's the large area, so it's the main uh, the how to say is uh, and and make this the pollution is the why in the large area. And this and this uh, video will show, but I think is this doesn't work. Um, this will show the activity of the uh, uh, of the people in the local area in the mountain in the northern parts of my country. That this is the deep forest and the clear and the area for agriculture purpose. And we start off the non point source and, and from the agriculture, the forestation, and the point source pollution from the factory and the industry. Uh, this, there are uh, the pollution source from the transportation and uh, some of uh, the source that come from the open burning in the village. <clears throat> uh, this information uh, can help me to classify this. Is this, this the short of the pollution? This is from a transportation. From, from the figure, you will see the height of the in high of the of the concentration of the PM255 is the always high in the 18th hour hour day of a weekday. 
on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And the information is always high in this time. But the Saturday and Sunday, the, uh, the, the information is not quite high. So this information show me that this star is from transportation. This is the one star in my country. Yes, uh, thank you. And so sorry for a little problem from my presentation. If you have a question, please welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lagoin. And so in the chat, so we have some comments and some questions in the chat. Actually, the first one, could you share this line to the audience? Um, if you can, please let us know. And OK, let's move to the questions from Dr. Vanessa. She will ask about uh, what Kasawa pollution is was the burning practice over the reduce of the Kasawa? So if so, it seemed to be quite different uh, practice from Thailand as far as uh, she anticipates. Or oh, uh, oh, Dr. Vanessa, you can ask uh, either like Pasa Thai Lao. Sabaydi Kokun Kla. Kong Sai Wat Homai Chai Tao. เอ่อมันสัมปะหลังใช่มั้ยคะคาสวาเอ่อเป็นเป็นเข้าใจถูกมั้ยคะว่าคาสวาพอลูชั่นคือโอเคโอเควีจัสเช็คฮิเอ
we all have very high level at the winter and springtime uh, and low PM 2.5 level in summer. Uh, for Chiang Mai, we can have a very clear peak of high periods of PM 2.5 in uh, Professor Song Pong says from February to April uh, because of my mud burning. Uh, that's one sometimes somehow reflect in air pollution in Vientiane and Yangon, but not very clear in Hanoi and uh, also not very clear in Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, so we have some very common air pollution pattern, uh, but also have some specific characteristic. Uh, in this one, uh, just similar with uh, Professor Kao from Laos, so we have also different uh, neural variation of PM2.5 in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh. In Hanoi, we have uh, low PM2.5 in midday and high, uh, even in the night time, we have quite high PM2.5 level. Uh, but the, the pattern in Ho Chi Minh City is different. We have quite clear PM2.5 peak uh, in the early morning. Uh, maybe that's one the transportation peak. Uh, this one is to show the uh, other air pollutants uh, in Hanoi. Uh, so I will skip this one. And this one is uh, uh, other problem of VOC. Uh, beside PM2.5, we also have uh, quite high VOC level. I think higher than in Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, sorry, my slide not moved. Uh, maybe I will show this presentation this way because it will be quicker. So this one here, another research, we found that VOC in Hanoi is a very well correlation with rush hour. Uh, so VOC binding very well with the emission from transportation. Uh, so I think maybe we have some similar pattern with other country in the neighborhood. Uh, about salt air pollution, uh, we have currently a um, well emission inventory from Dr. Kim Wang and we who also participate here. And the figure, I think, quite similar with what Professor Song Pong had shown for Thailand. We have a uh, crop residual burning about 40% and transportation here yeah, we have a little bit lower level about 13% and other uh, contribution from other source. Uh, I, I think residential combustion in Vietnam and maybe in Laos also is quite important. And this one is a figure of sort of postman for Hanoi. Uh, I will skip that one. Uh, that one is the data from inventory. So actually in the boss city, especially in Chimi city, we have quite high level of contribution from transportation. Uh, from Ho Chi Minh City, we have about 45% of PM2.5 contribute from transportation. And the other quite even for area source, uh, including household and restaurant burning, uh, I mean cooking, and the other for poor source, including uh, induction. Uh, for VLC, we don't have a very good uh, sort of postman, uh, but this one is to illustrate. Uh, if we uh, put the profile, profile of VOC in the in ambient with profile of uh, VOC emission from motorbike, we can find a quite clear similar pattern. Uh, it means that the contribution from motorbike to VOC in Hanoi is significant, it's quite clear. So I would like to come to the affecting factor. So this one is, uh, uh, this figure shows the effect of wind direction. Uh, we can see that and uh, polar, wind polar, 
and we can see that when the wind power, the wind speed is low, we have quite high level of PM 2.5. Uh, and the, the upper figure also show very clear figure of wind speed. So this one to show the clear effect of meteorological to the uh, level of PM 2.5 because it's will the unfavorable condition a meteorological condition you make uh, PM to purify and other pollution accumulates and make the level of that pollution increase. Uh, this one is the wind polar of uh, PM to purify in city and we have very similar pattern that when wind uh, speed is low, then we have high level of PM to purify. Uh, other research that we use the uh, a multivariable regression also show very high, uh, not very high, but high correlation uh, between meteorological factor and PM2.5. Uh, the other way to express is a meteorological factor can explain about 50% of the variation of PM2.5. Uh, so that is, I think, very important point to consider in control uh, air pollution, so we can, we should concentrate in the periods that uh, PM2.5 and other pollutants increase uh, because of the unfavorable meteorological factor. Uh, we also do uh, other research, that's this one also, you low cost sensor uh, PM2.5, to measure PM2.5 at some up three size. And then we apply random forest model uh, and we can well uh, file the behavior of the data and then we can explain the effect of different factor to PM2.5 variation. And the, uh, uh, sorry, this one is long-term transportation. So we had a uh, effect of long-term transportation uh, as a meteorological factor uh, and the short strength itself. I apply that factor, we have found the, uh, we have be able to remove the effect of meteorological factor and see the real effect of uh, COVID-19 social distancing on air quality. And we can find the uh, reduced number uh, of short emission. Um, that's contribute to the review of PM2.5 and CO in Hanoi. Uh, so that is my presentation uh, for the cause of air pollution in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor. Sir, Me. any questions from the audience? So, Professor Lee, thank you very much for the presentation. So, it appears is so is transportation the major source overall? Then, is it during the whole year? Professor Lee, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, but I I haven't heard any question. Yes. Uh, oh, okay. Sorry, uh, I was asking is the okay. so okay. summarizing the work. Uh, it, is, is it the transportation that is kind of the major source in Vietnam throughout the year? Yes, I think transportation is one of the major air pollution source. Uh, it's going to be maybe from 20 to 40, or even some research show 60% uh, based on the place. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I have one more question. Yes, please. Thank you, Professor Lee, for your very good presentation. So I would like to ask you to show us about the uh, inventory, right? The emission inventory. And you also have the data about the source profile using the model, right? I would like to know whether uh, both of them are uh, related together. They, do they give the similar uh, answers to the question of the source of air pollution? 
Uh, so for in, in Hanoi currently, uh, I mean last year, we have uh, they have a worm buying project that do both methods, inventory and also uh, receptor modeling based on the data on two sides and uh, the data is not very strictly matching, but I think it's reasonable matching between the two methods. So I think for Hanoi, we can quite certain about the short. I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure about other. Are there any questions from any of the uh, regional language channels, either from the Vietnamese channel or from the Thai channel? Can the interpreters please ask in, in the relevant rooms if they have any questions? Okay, hearing none, maybe we will assume that there are no questions. Uh, I think we will move forward to the next one. Thank you, uh, Professor Lee. Uh, so, so far we looked at the uh, sources, got an understanding of the different sources in these three regions and their respective contributions. So the next uh, session is on air quality management and the current uh, regulatory framework in place in these three countries. To start with, the first presentation is by Dr. Rob Pinder from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, he is a physical scientist at U.S. EPA, uh, Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards. His work is focused on strategies to simultaneously achieve climate change mitigation and improve air quality. He received his PhD from Carnegie Mellon University and has published more than 40 peer-reviewed journal articles. Dr. Rob Pinder uh, has recorded a video ahead of time. He was not able to be present uh, live for this session, but uh, he has uh, recorded a video ahead of time. So we will play the video. And if you have any questions, please do, uh, if you have any questions for Dr. Rob Pinder, please add them in the chat. And if uh, those questions, if we can answer those questions, we will do. Otherwise, we will uh, refer it back to Dr. Uh, Pin Rob Pinder and then uh, try to relay the answers back to you later. Hello, my name is Rob Pinder and I'm uh, uh, presenting to you today about the US experience in air quality management and policy development. And uh, very sorry that I couldn't be there in person, but looking forward to doing this virtually. And if there's anything that I can help with as a follow-up, any questions you have um, based on the material I present today, please uh, feel free to follow up with email and um, you know, myself, or we'll try to track down the right person to uh, address your question. So again, um, thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to discuss this with you today. So. Uh, brief outline of uh, my presentation, I'm going to start off with some key messages about air quality management in the US, and then uh, talk through a couple of examples that uh, I think are illustrative of these principles. And then lastly, uh, just offer a couple additional resources that we are working on to help um, provide more information for air quality management. So here are four key messages, and I want to really stress that these very much reflect the context and the uh, perspective of the US. And certainly, um, you know, each of you from your individual countries may have a different point of view, a different context. And uh, so I offer them more as uh, um, ideas and maybe they'll um, some, uh, inspire some uh, interest rather than um, you know, key recommendations. So here are some principles that, that we found uh, useful and valuable. The first one is that air quality management is really a continuous cycle of development and improvement um, with the goal over time of improving public health and the environment. And that is we put a policy forward. Um, sometimes we uh, know um, many things, but not everything about how effective that policy will be, but we put uh, structures in place to evaluate the, the progress and then go back and improve the policies over time. The second is uh, really national, regional, and local regulations, along with voluntary or market-based programs uh, are effective. These things together in the US have really brought down um, air pollution and improved air quality in the last few decades. 
the next one is regional cooperation is uh, critical. Something we often talk about is, you know, air pollution knows no boundaries, uh, no political boundaries. And so um, we find it really important to coordinate across sort of the state, local, and um, national level, as well as uh, um, in our border regions with Canada and Mexico. And, and it's likely the regional cooperation will be an important part of managing your air quality as well. And Lastly, something that we both um, struggle with, but also find very valuable is how can we best provide information to the public, both uh, as a way of input to the process we uh, use to develop our regulations and our standards, but also with output. How can we keep the public best informed about air quality and what they can do? So I'm gonna start by talking about the uh, air quality management cycle. Um, how we see this is it usually begins with establishing goals. So um, what level of um, environmental protection or human health protection do we want to achieve? And then we determine, well, what are the sources that are contributing to air pollution and what kinds of emission reductions are possible? That's the second step. The third step then is developing control strategies. So these are um, policy actions that would reduce emissions from individual sources or sectors. And then next, uh, based on those strategies, we implement programs to accomplish those strategies. So this could be um, both policy frameworks, but also legal frameworks, enforcement, um, all of those things. And then lastly, uh, evaluate, are we making progress toward our goals? Are we achieving what we thought we would achieve? And uh, go back and use that improved information to establish new goals or um, fine tune the regulatory approach. So it's very much very important that it's uh, we we continue around and, and view this as a cycle, not a once and done activity. And so, what are some of the tools we use in each of these steps? So, uh, oftentimes the first step is emission and certification. So we figure out uh, a method for determining um, how do we measure emissions from a facility or a source, and then certifying that method so it can be um, integrated with industry practices. The next is ambient measurements, so measuring the air quality in the atmosphere that people breathe. The next part is collecting emissions data, compiling inventories from all sources. And then lastly, it's important not to also um, ha have a capacity to collect health data so we can compare how is health changing relative to the changing air pollution. So in the US, we have national programs. These apply everywhere, so these could be um, uh, national emission limits for mobile sources like vehicles, uh, uh, performance standards for new industrial sources, um, consumer product standards. These are um, consistent nationally, but then there's often, there's also state level programs. So each state has unique uh, air quality source, air quality um, issues and may have unique sources or unique ways of um, accomplishing emission reductions. So we wanna keep that flexibility that the states have the authority to tune things to their local conditions. And so how this works in practice is that we at the headquarters office at, at the EPA, we develop guidance, we evaluate the science and we um, develop standards. But then the implementation of most of those actions and the enforcement and the permitting and the, um, the adaptation of those uh, national standards to local conditions is done in coordination with state governments, local governments, and our uh, EPA regional offices, which are sort of the EPA regional offices are spread all over the country. And they, they serve that role of um, uh, being that bridge between the national guidance and accomplishing um, emission reductions at a local scale. So I want to step through now a couple of examples of uh, uh, policy programs that um, sort of identify or, or give some more meaning to these key principles. So the, the first one I want to talk about is the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, um, and we often call this the NACS. So this is uh, uh, regulations in the form of a particular city or local area the annual average PM 2.5 concentration should not exceed 12 micrograms per meter cubed. Um, so it's a nationally applied standard that's defined in air concentration. So how do we go about setting those, uh, these NACs? So there's, there's three stages outlined in these, um, each of these individual boxes here. And the uh, 
it starts with a planning stage. So this is a lot of development of um, scope and understand and developing of a timeline. And it's important to note that each of these stages is is um, done in consultation with KSAC, which is the Clean Air Science Advisory Committee. So this is a group of scientists that are, um, uh, uh, you know, key leaders in the field who, who consult with us to help them uh, make sure that the best science is being incorporated into the process. Each of these stages also has a public comment period where, um, uh, you know, industry groups, NGOs, citizens provide comments into the process and we respond to those and incorporate them into our thinking. So after the planning stage is the assessment stage. So this has um, three parts, the integrated science assessment, where we go out and try to understand the science between the linkages between air pollution and um, uh, human health. And then we develop a risk and exposure assessment. So this is the, the quantitative assessment that's you know specifically for the conditions in the US right now what are the risks what are the exposures and uh, um, what would be the uh, effects of changing the um, the standard to a lower level and then lastly there's a policy assessment that looks at this from a, a policy perspective and uh, examines the and brings from these different assessments forward individual options that could be considered as a new standard. So then lastly is the rulemaking stage where um, it goes through various levels of uh, agency review and then finally is decided and selected by the administrator. So that's the standard setting process, but then on the implementation process, it's, it's very much a, um, a collaboration and, and um, working together with individual states. So the EPA designates which areas um, exceed the standards. Um, and we do that using ambient air measurements. And then the states develop implementation plans to describe how are they going to, what emission reductions are gonna be put into place, what laws are gonna go into effect that are going to reduce emissions to achieve that standard. And then um, lastly, this also can trigger additional um, kinds of uh, effects or, or regulatory um, uh, hooks for, for large industrial sources. So the implementation or the NAC setting process is a kind of a national level, but then the actual implementation for how do we get those emission controls is decided, is decided on the local level. Another example I want to um, bring forward is residential wood heating appliances and how we regulate that sector. So residential wood heating appliances, these are small stoves that are powered by wood uh, that are used to heat homes. And this is especially popular in rural areas. In, in large cities, most people you know, are connected to um, the gas system or the electricity system. Um, but many people prefer wood heating because uh, you know, they don't have to buy gas or, or um, electricity for heat in rural areas. So how we uh, regulate this sector is that um, we start by setting particulate matter emission limits for different kinds of, of appliances. So this could be of the form, you know, this unit is, uh, is allowed to emit so many grams of PM 2.5 per hour or per unit of heat generated. And once we establish that, um, that regulation, then there's a process which we uh, certify how do uh, laboratories test if an appliance is meeting that standard or not meeting that standard. So that's called the um, certification process. And then for appliances that go through that certification process, they get this sort of tag here that tells consumers, uh, you know, um, independent uh, scientific information about the performance of that appliance. So how much smoke does it emit? Um, how efficient is it? How well does it heat? And so, so this is sort of all bringing together uh, you know, a regulatory program that um, is set out to reduce emissions, uh, engagement with the manufacturers to certify the appliances that they've developed to meet those emissions. And then lastly, informing consumers about what are their options? How can they reduce smoke by buying a, a newer um, appliance? As well as education options, like education programs to help um, you know, teach people the best way to reduce emissions um, when they use the stove. You know, do they burn uh, dry wood that's gonna have the least amount of emissions? Okay, and then the last example I want to um, talk about is called our Air, Air Now Fire and Smoke Map. And this is a, a map that's uh, updated in real time, and it includes information from reference monitors. These are these little circles. 
and then low cost sensors, which are the small squares here. This is a sort of a zoom in of the um, San Francisco Bay Area in California. And you can see there are some uh, um, reference monitors, but then the low cost sensors really fill in a lot of the gaps. And these are color coded based on uh, how well the air, uh, uh, the current level of um, air quality that's being observed in that location. So green um, is, uh, you know, good air quality, and then it goes to yellow, orange, red, and, and um, purple. So then we can zoom out to the national map, and uh, additional information is sort of this gray area where there are smoke plume, plumes, fires, where there are forest fires burning, and then you can see some places in the central U.S. where the air quality is a little bit worse because of that. Um, but I want to stress a couple of things. This has been a very powerful public engagement tool. Um, Millions of people go to the uh, air now fire and smoke map when it's um, uh, wildfire season in California and the West. It's the most visited federal government website um, just because people really are looking for this information. And that engagement we find is is really important um, and really pu important public service. But I, what I really want to stress that it's not as simple as it looks to integrate the low cost sensor data. We had to do a lot of underlying work to understand uh, how well do these devices perform? How well do they perform during wildfire conditions? How do we, what kind of correction factors do we need to, um, to apply to the sensors to get it to be on a similar sort of scale as the um, reference monitors? And the other thing is it's, it's a lot of work uh, from a communication standpoint. We get lots and lots of questions um, in from the public asking us, you know, is my air quality okay? Uh, I've, I've seen this, um, this issue in my neighborhood and I'm really concerned. So having a really good communication strategy that makes it clear to people what, what the air quality means and what it means for their health. And lastly, what they can do uh, is really, really important. So those are the three examples I wanted to cover. And lastly, I just want to talk about a few more additional resources that we have. We're, um, develop, we've developed something called the Megacities Partnership, which provides national and local policymakers with a framework um, to develop and implement actions to improve air quality. It's very much in line with the sort of the circular framework that I showed at the beginning. There's a lot of useful information uh, at the website there, and I um, encourage you to check it out. And lastly, if you have any other questions, uh, please feel free to email me at my address there or um, uh, uh, reach out um, to other folks in our group. Uh, I think there's a, there's a way to, to contact from this webpage here too. So again, thank you very much and uh, look forward to any questions you have in the future. Okay, thank you very much uh, from US EPA. Uh, no, if anyone has any questions, um, they can post it in the chat. If not, we can move forward to the next one. Okay, okay, cool. Okay, for the next speaker, uh, please welcome Mr. Pansak Tiramongkon. He is a director of Air Quality and Noise Management Bureau, Pollution Control Department of Thailand, who will talk about the air quality standards and plans for Thailand. Please welcome. Good morning. My name is Pansak Tiramongkon. This is uh, next, uh, my ally for talking today. I'm going to start with uh, Thailand air quality standard and the current standard. And we, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, national agenda on solving the particulate matter problem, especially PM255. Let's start with introduction Thailand air quality standard. What is the ambient air quality standard? Ambient air quality standard. Uh, is the legal limit based on level of harmful pollutants in ambient air that cannot be exist during the given period of time. And there are three characteristics of the air quality standard. The first one is the allowable level of harmful pollutants in atmosphere and that defines the amount of exposure permitted to the population. The second one, air quality standards are expression of public policy and thereby requirements for the action that 
country intend to achieve in the future. The third one, the standard must give them consideration to the feasibility of achievement based on a broad range of economic, social, technical condition. And next, I'm going to briefly how Thailand set the air quality standard. We start with the, uh, the Enhancement and Conservation of National Environmental Quality Act of 1992, or we call Environmental Act. The Environmental Act give the empower or require to the National Environmental Board or NEB to set ambient air quality standard for the purpose of environmental quality enhancement and conservation. Next, NEB may set up the subcommittee on setting of air quality standard. And the subcommittee has duty to provide the recommendation on setting and reviewing of the uh, air quality standard. For pollution control department, my department has a responsibility to propose the ambient air quality standard to a uh, subcommittee and can be proposed directly to the NEB also. Now, let's go to the uh, current air quality standard. Current national air quality standard uh, in Thailand, we can uh, uh, separate or we can make a group of pollutants in two groups. The first one is the criteria pollutant, consists of CO, NO2, ozone, sulfur dioxide, GSP, PM10, PM2.5, and lead. The another group is the volatile organic compound and carbon dioxide. The air quality standard uh, consists of three components. The first one is the standard value. The second one is the averaging time, and the third one is the measurement method. And this is the next we're gonna show you the summary of uh, air quality standard for criteria pollutant. The first column is the uh, pollutant. And the middle column is the uh, averaging time, and the last column is the uh, measurement method. So, for Thai equity standard, must have the component like this. And I'm to saving the, the time. I'm go, I'm gonna go to in detail for each one. So let's, uh, let's go to the next slide. For the volatile organic compound group, we have three, uh, we have nine parameters for this group. And all, for every, everything time, only have annual average. And this is the uh, group of VOC. For the next slide, this is the uh, standard for Carbon dioxide only 24 hour average. Uh, not exceed the 100 microgram per cubic meter. Uh, and this is show why Thailand has a uh, carbon dioxide standard. Because of uh, we have the risk code region. Uh, company in, in our country. So carbon dioxide is the 
uh, raw material of this kind of factory. So uh, a lot of people complain with the smell of carbon dioxide and that be uh, for the government to set up the ambient air quality standard for sulfur dioxide and we use the uh, WSO guidelines at the uh, air quality standard for sulfur dioxide and for the next we I would like to talk about the reviewing and reviving the M255 standard plan. Uh, we have the rational for T rational to uh, review the M255 standard. Uh, the first one, uh, M255 standard has promulgated uh, since the year 2010. Uh, about 12 years ago. So it's quite a long time to use it. The second one, the implementation of national agenda action plan on solving the particular matter problem, which indicate that PM255 standard will be revised both in uh, 24 hour every and annual every uh, to be more strengthened in accordance with the WSO, WSO interim target uh, The last one, therefore, it is necessary to uh, revise the M255 standard to be more appropriate in accordance with scientific and technological focus and the change in the economic and social condition of the country. For reviewing PM255 standard, we have, this is a process of revise the standard. Uh, start with PCD uh, have to conduct the public hearing to the uh, video conference meeting and website or uh, we call the meeting uh, face to face also. Uh, next, after we have the conclusion of hearing, public hearing, we have to propose the DAP proposal PM255 standard to the subcommittee. And after subcommittee approved the DAP standard, DCD uh, gonna propose the uh, DAP standard to the uh, National Environmental Board for consideration. And after that, are now in the government process. This is a summary of the process to reviving the. Uh, PM to Wi-Fi standard. Uh, and next, I would like to talk about the challenge of air quality standard issue. The current air, the current ambient air quality standard, these are unsuitable to the circumstance should be revised and review and revise regularly to more appropriate in accordance with the scientific and technological focus and change in the economic and social condition of the country. And the last item, I like to uh, talk a little bit about national agenda on solving the particulate matter problem or PM255. Uh, this is an example of using the uh, ambient, air quality, ambient air quality standard as a goal of the master plan of the country. Since 
the government are now national agenda on solving the particular matter problem in uh, the year 2019 then we uh, all relevant organization have to make a plan action plan and use the uh, the ambient air quality standard as the goal of the plan and also next in the ad hoc plan also next slide ad hoc plan for solving a particular matter problem of the year 2022 which consists of one communication by prevention and three incident action uh, in the first column you you may see the communication communication is a is a kind of uh, daily action we have to communicate with uh, people daily basis to uh, report the situation of the pm 2.5 and also to uh, report the uh, next seven year forecasting of the PM 2.5 to promote the uh, 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 public awareness to the people. For the uh, middle column prevention, uh, this is a, this action is uh, we do before PM 2.5 assist assist a national standard and for the last one incident action this action will uh, turn on after pm 2.5 exit standard and this is a, a example for the action that uh, we do under the ad hoc plan uh, the with, with, uh, the PM 2.5 in Thailand, the source of PM 2.5 in the northern part of Thailand is the open burning. So the important action is the uh, fuel management. Actually, is the agriculture residual uh, management. Uh, we also have the uh, uh, open burning uh, reduction uh, mitigation uh, vehicle emission is uh, another thought that important in the urban area so when the uh, PM2 Wi-Fi exist standard uh, the relevant agency have to uh, Thickness of Boolean control from vehicle. For example, is that, uh, uh, we, we will have more checking point the uh, on load vehicle, uh, strengthen the uh, vehicle standard, and also warning the people for. Situate, uh, current situation and the next seven year forecasting. And at this slide, you may see the uh, report to the public uh, uh, in the bottom and the activity of uh, combat with the open burning in the right hand side. And this is all my presentation and thank you very much thank you director um thank you very much for sharing the accuracy standard in thailand and also updated plan to improve the accuracy in thailand so now can i move to uh another speaker from uh lounge who will talk about the accuracy standard and 
plants as well, but talk in, in the Lao country. So please welcome Mr. Tilakon again. Yes, uh, once again, uh, for me, uh, Tilakon Sisupan. And so sorry for uh, te technical problems. Yes, uh, for today, I will uh, present for a Lao, uh, Okay. Uh, last and regulation for the equity. Uh, also, we have a law for uh, on the uh, environment. Uh, is the rewind number 29 uh, December 2000. Okay. Uh, in Laos, we have a law on uh, environment protection. And uh, this is uh, some other way for that. Uh, this is the uh, revised number uh, 20, uh, 29th, and there's uh, the, uh, 18 December 2012. A comprehensive, this is a comprehensive tune for prevention and control the pollution management of uh, toxic to chemical and waste in Laos. And in this law, we have the Article 2 for pollution control and Article 3, that's the control of the toxic chemicals and the waste dispersal. The Article 4 is environmental certification and authorization. And in this article, we have the chapter 42 on the release of the pollution, which is a one of the tools used to uh, prevent and control the pollution. There are also a law and regulations related to pollution control. And uh, another law is uh, from another ministry, but the involvement of uh, the activity of the equality. Uh, this law is from uh, a forestry. It, it, this is the reverse number 64, and that's uh, 30, 13 June 2018. And in this law, the article five is uh, says how the government is policies on the forestry and the forest land for the protection uh, of the environment, water source, and biodiversity. Uh, in this law is the article six is there with the efficiency and the economic and economic use for forest and forest land. And the article uh, 52 this is the forest fire prevention and control and the article uh, zero, uh, eight, uh, 103 is the forest and forest common trade. <clears throat> <clears throat> and uh, this is the law. Uh, in large, we have the agreement. It, uh, this agreement is on nation environment standards. This revise is uh, a 20, uh, 20 and 17. This agreement was set out the nation, uh, the nation environment, environmental standards as a basis for environment monitoring and the control of the water, soil, and the air and noise pollution. And in this, uh, in this agreement, we, we have a, a parameter of the, ambient air, of the ambient air parameter that's indicated. Uh, for the first one, for the carbon monoxide, we have uh, uh, in one hour, uh, not more than uh, 30 ppm and uh, uh, nitrogen dioxide, and in one hour, not more than uh, 0 0.11 ppm. And for the sulfur dioxide, in one hour, not more than 0 uh, and 13 ppm. And that's only the gas we have the particulate also in the TS for the TSP, uh, in the 24 hour, not more than uh, 0 0.33 milligram per uh, cubic meter. And uh, for the PM10, uh, in the 24 hour, not more than 0 0.12 milligram um, per cubic And by, uh, especially is the for a PM 2.5, the PM 2.5 in, uh, in 24 hour, not more than 0 0.05 uh, milligram per cubic meter. <laughs> and this, uh, this table is uh, show the, uh, the standard uh, that we use for the ambient air quality monitoring that indicate. And not uh, especially from the uh, uh, ambient air quality standard, we have a uh, standards for control the, uh, the air quality so from the uh, uh, general in uh, general industry. Uh, in the general industry, we have especially for the TSP 
sulfur, NOx, and carbon monoxide. And these uh, figures they show the, uh, the, the, the standards for air quality control from the elect electric heating, electric power. And, and this agreement, we have uh, uh, standards for control the air quality for uh, vehicle also. Uh, for the first uh, figure is the found a uh, new vehicle. And for the second, the tables, it show the uh, uh, middle edge of use for the vehicles. And uh, we have uh, another agreement, that's a pollution control agreement uh, in, uh, for 2021. This agreement says our pollution control and uh, Remediation measuring pollution, monitoring pollution control, measure in the case of emergency, identify location and hazardous area and the pollution risk to reduce and the limit of the impacts of the air pollution, sorry, and water and pollution. And we play all the data and area and every, and we, uh, website maybe I will uh, the chat for be interested in and this presentation will show the quality minimum for the samplings this is one of the uh, uh, the handouts we set up for uh, who will uh, analyze for the pm 2.5 pm 10 or tsp this is will be the guideline for to be what equipment what the uh, technique that to be used and this is to show air quality index. In Laos, we have an air quality index. And in every day, we, uh, uh, we uh, display uh, all the information that we monitor in every station. And we got uh, the data from each uh, station and we uh, compare with the air quality index. And we uh, display for the uh, show, show, show show in every day. And last, we have a, we have a seven levels of a, a air quality index in, in last, and this is this is the each parameter and referring to the the number of the concentration. And for the future plans, we will support the development of regulatory and policy tools on the national and the sector levels to reduce the pollution levels. And the priority area includes local area air quality management plan and the government to significant increase as a well defined and targeted budget for the air quality pollution monitoring and the pollution prevention and the control include increase staffing in the pollution control department and establish as well staff until for air pollution control as a part for staff until linked to each primary monitoring station Increase staff and budget for theories in the evolution monitoring and modeling survey and uh, reportings. Oh. Yes, I think <laughs> that's all for my presentation. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chilakon. Again, so really happy to see your 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 data, your information. So this is a good chance to update to each other. Okay. So the last speaker from Vietnam, they will talk about the Vietnam equity standard and plan as well. Please welcome Professor uh, Nguyen. I'm really apologize if I uh, pronounced your as a wrong name. Okay, from University of Engineering and Technology, Vietnam National University, Hanoi. Please welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, please uh, let me share my screen. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, my name is Tang Nguyen. Please uh, call me Tang. First of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizer for inviting me to join this workshop. Uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, today, I would like to present the Vietnam air quality standards and the plan for air pollution mapping in Vietnam. Uh, in my presentation, I will briefly introduce the Vietnam AQ standard and air quality management plan. 
Also, the current evolution monitoring in Vietnam and uh, some application that we uh, propose to use the evolution uh, mapping uh, using uh, both the satellite approach and uh, chemical transportation model. Uh, as you know, that the uh, evolution is a serious problem in Vietnam. The Vietnamese government uh, issued the ambient air quality standard uh, we call the QCVN in uh, 2030. So in which the eight pollutant uh, was taken into account. Also, this is the first time particulate matter concentration is the PM 2.5 and the PM 10 was uh, mentioned. And uh, the pollutant uh, is considered for the short term exposure, it means the one hour, eight hour, and 24 hour average. And uh, also uh, considered for the long term exposure uh, represented by annual mean. And all air quality parameters uh, are uh, carried out under the guidance of the different national technical standards and we call the, the TCVN. The red number uh, indicates the air quality global level is recommended by WHO in 2021. And uh, we can see that uh, for many uh, pollutant level, uh, the Vietnamese uh, uh, standard uh, is uh, much lower. Uh, so, air quality management uh, is a very important task and uh, implemented uh, by government units. Uh, according to the Environmental Protection Law we uh, updated in 2020, the uh, state management involved to this task uh, as a prime minister. The Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment, and also the Provincial People Committee. And we have uh, both the national plans and provincial plan for air quality management. For national uh, plan, the duration is for five years. So the task is include the activity is uh, firstly to assess the management and control of air pollution at national level and also need to identify the main core of air pollution. Uh, after that, uh, we can identify the overall and specific uh, goals and to realize it uh, by uh, proposed uh, tasks and solution uh, for air quality management. Uh, after that, the priority program and the project uh, is uh, proposed to perform the task and solution and also to develop the regulation on coordination and measure to manage the inter-regional and inter-provincial environment quality. And the last step is the organization for the implementation. So for the period 2021 to 2025, we already have a national plan for air quality management. Uh, approved by Prime Minister uh, on uh, November uh, last year. And the main goal of this uh, plan is to enhance the management of air quality uh, through the control of emissions should see and to monitoring the ambient air quality and also is a focus on warning and forecasting air quality in order to improve the air quality environment and also to protect the uh, public health. For the provincial plan, uh, it is uh, um, customized for each province. The duration is uh, determined uh, based on the, um, uh, the, the, the local characteristic of province, for example, like area or level of air pollution, the current management and improvement so solution, and also the local implementation and condition. The step to implement the provincial uh, plan is uh, uh, following the, the, the national plan, uh, but is more detailed and with a lot of uh, adjustment for, uh, for it, the provincial situation. Um, we see that the uh, Evolution, uh, the assessment of evolution is a very key point for 
both the national and provincial plan. So uh, in order to have information of uh, 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 air pollution situation, uh, they often stay on air pollution monitoring data. And currently, the, uh, this kind of data is uh, measured and collected from the ground measurement. So this is an example of uh, air quality statistics station network uh, over all the country and uh, managed by uh, the government. But uh, of course, you know, with the development of technology uh, today, we have uh, many kinds of the device such that the uh, sense, uh, sensing station, the handheld, or also the low cost uh, sensor. So we also have uh, many updated information. Uh, Besides, uh, we have uh, with the, the, the new achievement on the satellite technology, we can have uh, the air pollution mapping from the satellite with a, a larger uh, scale. Uh, for example, this is uh, an application of the carbon monoxide around the globe. Uh, is uh, measured by Sentinel 5P satellite over the Asia, Africa, and South America. We all know that uh, with the ground measurement, we we have uh, the data with the uh, advantages in uh, high um, uh, uh, frequency and high accuracy. But of course, we also know that it's limited in the uh, spatial coverage. And on the other hand, with the satellite data, we can have uh, the observation at the larger scale, but this limited, uh, limited in the uh, observation time and also the quality. Uh, therefore, the mapping methodology or modeling technique is very important. Uh, to combine the data from the different sources and uh, provide a complete view of uh, air pollution uh, um, situation in the uh, provincial, national, and also regional scale. So in the next uh, section, I would like to introduce some sample using the air pollution map uh, from the, uh, based on the satellite approach. Um, so please let me uh, try to move this. Uh. So this is the PM 2.5 concentration uh, data set. Uh, we, the value is uh, daily mean of uh, PM 2.5 and uh, the spatial resolution is uh, three kilometers and it has uh, the full coverage of Vietnam and uh, we have uh, the data set uh, in the long term period is from 2012 to 2021. And to create this map, we use a mixed effect model, is one kind of statistical model uh, process on the satellite aerosol optical data, data uh, the meteorological parameter, and land use information. And of course, we need a lot of ground uh, PM 2.5 measurement. So this is uh, an example of uh, the monthly average of uh, PM 2.5 in uh, uh, 2017. And you can see the, uh, the, the distribution of uh, PM 2.5 in Vietnam and also the uh, seasonal variation. So currently this uh, kind of map is applied in, the, in, in many ways. Uh, first of all, we use this map. We can use this map to make the report on the PM 2.5 status in Vietnam, as uh, from uh, 2090 to 2020. And I will present some example in the next slide. And uh, with this kind of the data set, we are able to calculate the PM 2.5 for each province uh, by year. So this kind of information also can be used to like the input to calculate the provincial environment, uh, environmental performance index. Um, and uh, also this kind of information can be used for the health impact assessment to see how impact of uh, um, PM 2.5 on the public health or in the mortality. And uh, now is the, in Vietnam, the province start to do the uh, provincial air quality management plan and some uh, uh, research group and also some um, province is start to ask us the data to, uh, uh, to, to, to provide as an input 
for provincial ecology management plan. So this is uh, uh, the example uh, we, how we use the PM 2.5 map to, to assess the PM 2.5 status. Uh, on the left side, you can see the annual average PM 2.5 in 2019, and in the right is in 2020. And uh, we can see that uh, the, the area with high level of uh, PM 2.5 concentration is uh, in here is the Red River Delta, is the Hanoi and Nebo province. And we have uh, some uh, highlight in the area close to the coastline is belong to Thanh Huang An and Ha Tinh province. And uh, in the south, uh, we have a high level of PM 2.5 in Ho Chi Minh City, Dong Nai and Bình Dương. And uh, compared to map, and we see the annual mean of PM 2.5 in 2020 is a degree is compared to the 2090. And as you know, that's the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic also make the uh, 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 decreasing and also readily reported in many publication. And uh, based on this map uh, 2020, uh, we found that uh, 10 out of uh, 63 province in Vietnam have annual mean of PM 2.5. Uh, exceeds the national standard PCVN and uh, currently that standard is uh, 25 uh, microgram per meter cubic for the endomine of PM 2.5. Uh, it is a similar average, but we make it a uh, uh, similar analysis, but we make this uh, for the uh, two mega city in Vietnam is Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh city and at the district level. And uh, we can see the endomine of uh, PM 2.5 for each district. And for the Hanoi 29, uh, our uh, 30 district uh, have an annual mean PM 2.5 exceeds the national standard. And in Ho Chi Minh City, this number is 12 out of uh, 24. So there also the uh, similar approach, but we create the evolution map at higher resolution. So uh, this uh, PM 2.5, PM 10, and O2 and CO for a three meter resolution is a very detailed and it's a very good for the detailed monitoring and reports and also for the impact assessment of uh, like the public health, economic, and also the transport and urban planning. Uh, this is another example of uh, the hotspot uh, detection and visualization. So the triple me in the sensor on the um, Sentinel 5P um, satellite, and they provide the NO2 density product. So this is the NO2 density map over the Vietnam, and we um, uh, tend to let average it uh, during the lockdown period uh, in April in 2020 uh, because of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And during this time, uh, most of human activity is reduced, even the factory activity. But you can see here when we um, uh, combine, associate this map with the location of factory, uh, here we consider the, the, the factory is the Coast fire plan is the corresponding to the red point. The yellow point is the steel factory, and the green one is the cement plant. And we can see the, the high level of NO2 density uh, observed in many locations that uh, have uh, the, the, the factory. And when we combine with the wind direction and wind speed, and we can investigate the um, the, 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 the transportation of uh, evolution. So this is uh, another um, example. Uh, we following the same approach, but to investigate the long range um, transportation uh, for the Hanok. So this is the black carbon concentration as obtained from the MERA reanalysis uh, data set. And uh, we found that uh, for the different month. And we found that uh, in the March, we have a higher forest biomass burning. From 
southwest of Vietnam and Laos and maybe in have a local right residual burning, but uh, we only observe the increasing of the BC concentration in October. And in the December, we have a very high loading of uh, of the China and with the uh, northeast monsoon, uh, they may bring the transport uh, to the northern Vietnam and the Hanoi. So this is another the application that we simulate the air pollution using the webcam model. Uh, for the webcam model, we uh, mainly focus in the northern Vietnam. And uh, this is a present the distribution of uh, PM 2.5 and PM 10 in the northern Vietnam. Here is a PM 10 and PM 2.5. And here is in January. Uh, uh, 2040 and is uh, then uh, July in 2040. January is the winter month and July is the summer month. And we see the increasing of, uh, of air pollution in the northern of Vietnam. And the spatial distribution of this map is quite similar to the map obtained from the satellite, although the two approaches is uh, different. And uh, this kind of map can be associated with the, the rectifier to see the effect of uh, biomass uh, burning. Uh, and uh, the last one is uh, we investigate the effects of the monsoon. So this uh, period is of, uh, happened the, the, the monsoon in the northern Vietnam and uh, we have the data before, uh, during, and after the monsoon, and you can see the increasing of uh, PM 2.5 concentration in the northern Vietnam uh, during the monsoon, and this is an example in January 2090. So in, uh, in conclusion, uh, we see that the Vietnam uh, AQ standard uh, is lower than the AQG standard recommended by WHO in both uh, 25 and 2021. 20, uh, uh, similar to the Thailand's case, I think the Vietnamese uh, AQ standard need to review and uh, revise. So the plan to meet the WHO interim tactics may be, have a notable benefit for the local health. Uh, secondly, uh, the assessment of air pollution level and uh, investigates the uh, potential emission sources is a, a key component for both the national and provincial plan uh, on air quality management. So besides the air pollution monitoring networks, so air pollution mapping on the satellite approach or chemical transport modeling is a valuable supplement information. And the application may include the uh, assessment uh, air pollution status in time and space at the provincial, national, and regional scale, and also to uh, uh, investigate the potential emission sources or provide the data for the impact assessment of uh, air pollution on environment, economic, and uh, human health. Uh, thank you. If you need uh, more information, so please uh, contact me by this email. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor really good information that we will share together in this meeting so uh before we finish i wanna i'm gonna ask the questions from the chat box and uh please uh answer these questions <laughs> so for the first question from Lund, uh i think he asks uh pollution control department oh he asks from um he asks Lau. okay are there plans to control biomass burning in Laos? Uh, Mr. Chilagon, could you please answer these questions? Uh, once again, for the question, please. Okay. Are there plans to control biomass burning in Laos? So do you, do you have any plan to oh, control yeah. biomass in Laos? Because you say biomass burning is kind of the major source of air pollution. For for this uh, uh for this problems we are regarding to the uh 
Ministry of the Forest. Yes, min, min, Ministry of the Forest B, because uh, this because this task is uh, belong to uh, the uh, Ministry of the uh, Forest. Uh, oh, okay, okay, thank you. And um... and in every, and and every year, uh, this ministry they they are. Uh, they uh, make the uh, announcements for uh, early on the year. Okay. Okay. And um, especially in the uh, this period, a uh, uh, time in the dry season. Okay. For for the next questions, uh, from Dr. Vanessa, she is mm -hmm. to ask uh, Dr. Tang from Vietnam. Uh, if you have compared the wolf cam modeling uh, result with the monitoring data, and is there a plan to uh, supply the info to the policy maker? Yes, uh, thank you for the, uh, your question. Uh, we already compared the wolf cam uh, modeling result with the monitoring data and we uh, public uh, this in the paper also. So if you interest, I can send it uh, to you. And uh, of course, we uh, already try to work with the uh, policy maker and to deliver the satellite and webcam result. Uh, at the moment, they start to, of course, that is a long term communication. And at the moment, they start to use our data as a reference. But uh, you know that, however, there are uh, many concerns um, on the approach and also the data quality. For example, uh, for the webcam, the main question is uh, we don't have uh, the Vietnamese uh, emission inventory. And then we use a uh, global emission uh, data set. So this is also the big question and meet in the time and also another activity to, 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 to complete the, the work. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I have a question. Yeah. So uh, Professor Tan, very nice presentation. Thank you uh, very much for sharing your work. Uh, the, uh, I had a question regarding the satellite mapping product that you have developed for PM 2.5 at uh, three kilometer resolution. Uh, can you share a little bit on the performance of that model? Like how well did that model compare, uh, the estimated values compare with the measurements, uh, wherever measurements were? Uh, yes, we already have uh, that uh, kind of comparison. To, I, I can send the, the article after the, the, the presentation. And uh, also, I make the comparison with the other global PM 2.5 map. You know that the people use the PM 2.5 uh, global map to make the health impact assessment. And uh, because of uh, our model, we use a local measurement. So the quality of the map is a better much. Yes. So thank I can share the information after the, the workshop in the meeting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I think it would be very helpful. Uh, one follow up question I had is obviously in this project, one of our goals is to increase the spatial resolution of ground monitors. Obviously, we are using low cost sensors. But after correction, uh, bias correction, we hope that would be a good resource. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that maybe uh, you could be an important stakeholder where this data could help further refine your model if it will be helpful uh, or some way of kind of integrating the sensor data with the satellite based estimates that you already made. Yeah, that is a very helpful uh, uh, data source. Also, it is a new direction. Just combine both the low cost sensor and satellite to have uh, the, the better map. So, I, I would like to, to use the data of uh, your project if possible. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thanks again for the wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we finish this workshop, uh, I would like to announce like 
Uh, could you please uh, evaluate the the evaluations of uh, workshop? So I think our staff will send the link in the chat. Okay. And and then you can scan uh, the QR code from from the screen and please uh, you evaluate this workshop for, for today, okay? And actually, I would like to inform you a little bit about the schedule for day two. So for day two is quite interesting because we're gonna talk about the air quality monitoring status and plans in three countries, Thai, Thailand, Vietnam, and Laos, and also talk update the uh, AQC monitoring network. So there are two sensor installations in this project, including uh, Purple A and Dust Boy. We can update the status and data uh, for all of you guys. And the last one, we also have the uh, open the sections that uh, the section to discuss on the air quality issue and challenge in each country as well. Hope to see you tomorrow again. So podcast, do you have something to say? Yeah, thank you very much, Natipon. I would like to thank uh, everyone who attended the workshop today and thanks to uh, all the speakers for uh, presenting the work. Uh, it's been very uh, educating for at least for me uh, to understand and uh, to know the standard sources and the interactions in, in those uh, in, in, in Southeast Asia. I hope everyone else found it to be useful. Uh, we would uh, invite you to uh, continue participating tomorrow and day after tomorrow. As Natipon showed, we have great discussions for tomorrow and on Wednesday and uh, your feedback there will be very helpful. And uh, again, uh, like please, please do complete that survey. It's just uh, three quick questions. It wouldn't take more than a minute. Uh, we would like to know uh, whether you learned anything new today. Uh, some of you, you are experts, but perhaps others may have learned something. So your input would be very helpful. So um, yeah, uh, th thanks again. And we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. And thanks to the uh, our wonderful team of collaborators on this project who have uh, helped uh, put together this workshop and uh, we'll continue this for the next two days. Thank you. Back to you, Natapon. See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye.